Welcome everybody to today's webinar. This webinar series is brought to you by SAFMED and SAFMED, as you know, is your solutions partner in both the CSSD and the operating room and they have been so for the last 35 years. Thank you for sponsoring this SAFMED. Welcome to our webinar series and this is number three in our series focusing on effective cleaning of instruments and devices. In this series, we started off by making sure we clearly understood what cleaning means, understanding the definition of cleaning, and thoroughly then understanding manual cleaning as a concept, semi-automated cleaning, where we focused on ultrasonic cleaners last week, and this week, of course, we'll be focusing on automated washer disinfectors and how well they can clean as well. In summary, from last week, we learned that the components of an ultrasonic cleaner, uh, what they were, how they made up, and how, as a whole, ultrasonic cleaners can work and function. We spoke about the factors to consider when purchasing an ultrasonic cleaner. We learned more about how to load and unload them, and also the importance of following the manufacturer's instructions for use, how to uh, decontaminate the machines themselves, how to look after them, how to check them, how to make sure that they're operating and functioning correctly. And we finished off with understanding, uh, uh, thoroughly going through the benefits of ultrasonic cleanings, cleaners, and their role in the prevention of surgical site infections. As a reminder, of course, we started right in the beginning of our series with this slide, and that was about the importance of what we need for, effective to be, for cleaning to be effective. And ultimately, we need three important things. We need detergent. We need detergent to break down, to loosen, and assist in the removing of soils, like proteins and lipids, for example. We need friction, friction that is produced either by a manual action, as in rubbing and scrubbing, or with a mechanical action, like for example, cavitation in ultrasonic cleanings, or the force of the water in a washer disinfector. And thirdly, without any, um, with, uh, we certainly need water, and water is there to aid in the process of removing and rinsing soil away, as well as wetting instruments in essence. The end result, of course, is that instruments or devices that are being cleaned are at, le at the very least visibly free from dirt, stains or impurities. As I said, webinar one, we focused on manual cleaning, everything we require in order to effectively clean something manually. Webinar two, our focus was on ultrasonic cleaning. And here in webinar three, we are going to focus on cleaning using an automated washer disinfector. But before we delve into that, let's go back to our research. This is a really interesting publication. It was published in 2014 already. Um, Southworth uh, was, the, was the author. It's titled, titled Infections and Exposures, Reported Incidents Associated with Unsuccessful Decontamination of Reusable Surgical Instruments. So this was in 2014, as I say. And Southworth goes on in this uh, publication to state that surgical instruments provide a potential route for transmission, as we can see. And as, as such, the decontamination process between uses is a vital component in the prevention of healthcare-associated infections. Southworth also reminds us that before sterilization, instruments must first be cleaned we need to remove soils from surfaces and the reason for that is that the presence of the organic or inorganic materials on surgical instruments can interfere with the sterilization process and they do that by physically blocking the microorganisms from contact with the microbial agent which of course in steam sterilization would be steam when low temperature sterilization it could be vaporized hydroperoxide so those organisms, those potential microorganisms by a burden are going to prevent um, uh, contact with the actual microbial agent. And that's why it's so very important to clean things. So in this particular research, what South, Southworth did was um, he searched through a whole bunch of publications using various um, uh, platforms where one looks through uh, published papers, and he searched looking for various keywords and phrases. And at the end of the day, the results were screened to identify articles reporting outbreaks, infections, exposures, or incidents that related to inappropriate or unsuccessful decontamination of surgical instruments. 
Out of that, 21 relevant articles were actually retrieved, um, and they all focused on incidents associated with failures in the decontamination of surgical instruments. These papers included a, a variety of different types of incidents and it could, have, could have included things like not rinsing instruments correctly after soaking them in a high level disinfectant or issues relating to contaminated steam, for example, but a few of them were relating specifically to cleaning. What Sato says is that the most striking finding of the review that he did of all these published papers is how few incidents had been reported actually relating to the failure of reprocessing of surgical instruments. So he only identified 21 articles uh, around instrumentation, but in the same, same time frame, he actually uh, had identified 147 published papers that looked at um, decontamination failures relating to flexible endoscopes, which was quite interesting because, of course, we perform a lot more surgical procedures than we do endoscopic procedures or, or flexible endoscopic procedures as such. He also goes on to state that it's important to note that the incidents summarized here are likely to only be the tip of the iceberg. And that really can be the result of reluctance to publish failure. Of course, one, one doesn't really want to publish your failures uh, or hang out your dirty laundry. And they can, of course, be publication bias. And that can be biased towards certain microorganisms that are more interesting or incident types that are more interesting as a result. So maybe those are the things that add to uh, the findings in this particular paper. But having said that, there are still a multitude of published papers that talk about the issues and the concerns around incorrect or inappropriately decontaminated instruments and their consequences. Right. From the research back to our topic, and of course, as we said, we're here to talk about automated washer disinfectors and that method of cleaning today and its efficacy or not. Right, automatic cleaning. Uh, MacDonald and Shear in our textbook uh, remind us of what the advantages and disadvantages are of automated cleaning. Yes, there are disadvantages, and the, and the truth is that um, automated cleaning is not necessarily possible for all devices. Some devices may not be able to go into an automated process and will have to be cleaned manually. Of course, the equipment itself will need some form of maintenance and the outcome at the end of the day or the cleaning efficacy can really be affected by how we load our washer disinfectors. So incorrect loading can play a role in the outcome of cleaning. What are the advantages? Well, they certainly outweigh the disadvantages and that is that firstly, the cycles are fully automated. The cycles are repeatable, which means the machine will take in the right amount of water, the right temperature, the right amount of detergent, the right amount of chemistry, will dose it at the right time and uh, wash with the same force of water every single time. The other thing is that we can monitor and verify or validate that the machine itself is working, both by looking at the printouts as well as by looking um, by testing using uh, cleaning effic efficacy testing. Very important concept is that automated cleaning minimizes the handling, minimizes the number of times that we as staff need to actually handle these contaminated instruments, and that goes a long way for staff safety. And then as well is the thermal disinfection and the drying phase. Uh, we often obviously in manual uh, cleaning do not do any drying, but most importantly is thermal disinfection. And thermal disinfection happens at a really, really high temperature that you wouldn't be able to do if you were cleaning the instruments manually. You could never maintain the water at that temperature, for example. And thermal disinfection now not only protects the staff themselves, but of course also the patient. So a double-edged sword or double-edged advantage uh, is thermal disinfection. Although, of course, it will depend on the washer design, the washer should always be capable of providing a consistent process that will include a pre-wash, a main wash, a rinsing phase, of course. Very important concept. Now, when it comes to washer disinfectors, of course, you don't want to head down the road and buy the one from Pick and Pay or your local uh, distributor. Uh, a washer disinfector used in the hospital setting must be bespoke. It's one that would be manufactured according to the ISO standard ISO 15883. 
Now, there are seven parts to the standard. It's quite a complex standard, but a fascinating read. Um, and number one, or part one, starts with the general requirements, terms, definitions, and tests. Part two refers to the requirements and the tests that are required specifically for washer disinfectors that have a thermal disinfection phase and that are used for washing critical and semi-critical medical devices. So those are the washers that most of us have available in our CECDs. Part three is the requirement and tests for washer disinfectors that we use for human waste containers, so bedpan washers and urinals. Part four are the washer disinfectors, the requirements and the tests for washer disinfectors that uh, are used for cleaning thermal labile endoscopes, so our flexible scopes. Part five is all the test methods, so the things that we use to demonstrate cleaning efficacy. So it's the test that you're going to place inside the washer, for example, like an STF load check, um, that tells you or helps to verify whether or not the washer is functioning effectively. Part six and part seven are a little bit newer, and they are for devices, uh, for washers that clean devices that are non-invasive, that are non-critical. And part six is, is machines that use a thermal disinfection process, and part seven is for machines that use a chemical uh, disinfection process. So those are quite new, those two sections to the standard. You may say, ah, so, yeah, yeah, that's international, but what about South Africa? South Africa has already adopted a number of the ASA 15883 guidelines already. Um, so we have got SANS uh, um, 15883 Part 1. We've adopted Part 2 for washer disinfectors. We've adopted Part 4, which is the ones for endoscopes, and we are in the process of adopting Part 3, um, the one for uh, bedpan washers. Now, one of the things that you find in the standard itself when it comes to automated washer disinfectors, and perhaps this is the, um, the value add of these machines, is that they are all equipped or have to be equipped in order to be conforming to the standard itself with two processes. And the process processes work independently from each other. And those processes uh, will then uh, uh, mean that the machine is equipped with a controller and the machine is equipped with a sensor. So that at the end of the day, the controller will be the thing that controls the process. So it'll control the temperature of the water or it'll control how much detergent is dosed. But the sensor itself will be the thing that actually monitors and ensures that the, those parameters that were set were actually achieved. The sensors will monitor things like process parameters like temperature, water pressure, water levels, chemistry, injection quantities, that kind of thing. So as I said, for example, the controller you may set to maintain uh, the temperature at 40 degrees C, and the sensor will, will then check that the temperature was actually reached. So it ensures that everything is done as it should be. Now, if there's a variance, as in the temperature isn't as, or the water temperature isn't as hot as it should be, then the controller is going to come into action again and heat up the water again. So making sure that there are always two independent systems, some that control, some that sense and monitor, to make sure that that which you are supposed to be achieving was actually achieved. So that's the safety system here for a washer disinfector. Uh, uh, manufactured according to the ISO 15883 standard. Independent monitoring and process verification, important concepts. The, a typical cycle for a washer disinfector includes a pre-wash, a cleaning phase, a rinse, a disinfection phase, and a drying phase. Now, some of those uh, parameters can be adjusted slightly, and uh, many cycles may use pre-wash and two cleaning phases, or two pre-washes, and then a rinse, uh, then a clean, then a rinse. So, uh, very important that the essence of the cycle remains the same, but of course, there are some potential changes or variances to it. The pre-wash is going to remove things like transport gels and foams, and it thoroughly wets the instruments to prepare them for soil removal. Now that pre-wash uh, is always at under 50 degra 50, 45 degrees C, sorry. For that 45 degrees C, 
Why? Because temperatures higher than 45 degrees C can cause protein coagulation during the flushing stages, and that at the end of the day causes cleaning problems. And it's kind of like baking the proteins onto the instruments, and it becomes very difficult to remove them after that. The cleaning or the wash phase, or the actual cleaning part of it, is the next phase. Here, the instruments are cleaned using chemistries to break down and remove the various soils. In the rinse phase, which makes good sense, we're going to remove the detergent residues in the soils. In the disinfection phase, it's a thermal rinse. So it's a rinse at a specified time, uh, um, amount of time at a specified temperature to thermally rinse the, and thermally disinfect the instruments, making them safer to handle. And after that, we have the drying phase. In the drying phase, in that phase, moisture is removed from the washer chamber. Hot air is circulated through the chamber to thoroughly dry the instruments. So those are concepts of what a typical cycle looks like. And if you think about that and you come to, um, to realize that, it's really very difficult to replicate that in manual cleaning. So this just goes to show what the value adds are and the advantage are of an automated washer disinfector cycle. Water performs three important roles in the automated washer disinfector cycle. It's the physical force for impingement, it delivers the cleaning solution, and it transfers heat to the instruments for the disinfection phase. So uh, <clears throat> when we talk about water, it is actually very, very important that the amount of water delivered during each phase of the cycle must be 100% accurate. As I said, water pressure is used to help clean and rinse the instruments, right? This is also known as the impingement value um, in washer disinfectors, and that's the mechanical force of water against the surfaces inside the chamber. High impingement means that the water is sprayed at a really high pressure within the chamber, whereas a low impingement washer, there seems to be there's, um, a less use of, of water force and perhaps more reliance on chemistry to achieve the desired cleaning result. So if you think about that now, if there's too much water, the chemical dilution could be inaccurate, and that will mean that the chemistry could be too diluted, and that would mean that we could perhaps not clean the instruments properly. On the other hand, if there's too, uh, too much water, or I mean too little water, it means that the chemistry will be very concentrated. It's not diluted correctly, and a concentrated chemistry can also leave unseen re residuals on the instruments, and at the end of the day, um, can result in them not really being properly cleaned. Not enough water, there won't be enough force to clean with, uh, in some instances, the machine will alarm and may, I'm sure, will alarm and then may even abort the cycle depending on that actual incoming water pressure. So water pressure is very, very important when it comes to installing our washer disinfectors. Now, if you remember, uh, if you attended webinar one, we spoke about this published paper uh, that looked at complex design of surgical instruments as a barrier for cleaning effective, uh, effectiveness and, of course, that favoring biofilm formation. What the researchers told us over there is that um, the microbial load on an instrument that's used during surgical procedure can be as high as 1,500 colony forming units per instrument. And that's high. And those microorganisms need to be dealt with. Uh, and one of the ways that we do that as part of our cleaning process is subject them to thermal disinfection. So thermal disinfection at the end of the day, making the instrument safer for the staff to handle, as well as making it safer for the patient at the end of the day, of course. So in ASO and Science 15883, they talk about this concept known as the A0 value. And the A0 value is the time required to achieve a specific or a specified log reduction of microorganisms based on the temperature and the time of the thermal disinfection cycle. So I'm sure you remember in steam sterilization, when we're sterilizing an instrument, we want a log reduction of microorganisms to 10 to the minus 6. That's our goal in terms of sterilization. Of course, with disinfection, it's not as high as 10 to the minus 6, but we need to clearly disinfect our instruments. 
So we are going to be needing to kill a defined number of microorganisms. So a manufacturer can, for example, set the water temperature at 90 degrees in order to achieve the right amount of dis disinfection or the correct level of disinfection. And um, at 90 degrees, the, uh, the standard tells us that in an instrument washer, that that cycle must run for a minimum of one minute. At the end of the day, the degree to which a device needs to be disinfected will depend on where the device is going or how we are using that device. So, for example, a non-critical device like a bedpan uh, only needs a lower level of disinfection, and in the standard, it equates that to an A0 value of 60. Uh, for a semi-critical device, we need a far higher level of disinfection, and therefore the A0 value uh, is referred to as 600 for an automated washer disinfector. And for a bedpan wash, as I said, the A0 value is 60. Before. For surgical instruments as a whole, we need a high level of disinfection, and that's why we would set our temperature for perhaps 90 degrees, and the rinse cycle must be for one minute. The manufacturer of the machine itself may uh, adjust that if they want to. If they're choosing to use a lower temperature, like 85 degrees, for example, they would then run that disinfection cycle for three minutes. So that's the, um, the relationship of the A0 value as described in ISO 15883. So this was an, a paper published in 2020 in the Central Serialization Journal. It's a journal out of um, Germany that is printed in both English, thankfully, and in German. Um, and it is specific to CSST matters or sterilization matters as such. In there, this particular article uh, or published a paper was published, as I said, in 2020. And the title was Reprocessing of Medical Devices in Exceptional Situations, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic. And a statement made in this uh, publication is really nice to understand that hot water is the best disinfectant available in the hospital and protects the CC employees during packaging. And that the zero value is monitored reliably by recording the temperature time integral inside the washer disinfector. So nice to know that the washer disinfector is going to help protect the patient as well as the staff. McDonald and Shared, of course, remind us of these important topics when it comes to working with an automated washer disinfector. They, of course, focus on the importance of preparing the instruments for the load before you actually load them, and that would include disassembling, or open things up. Uh, if you've got a box joint, if you've got a screw joint to actually open up the instruments. If they're parts that can be taken apart um, and, and still placed in the washer, that's what you would be doing at that point. They also talk of the importance of loading the washer correctly. As you can imagine, how we load it matters. The importance of choosing the correct cycle, now, because some washers may have um, a disinfection cycle or a cycle that doesn't wash at all, but is purely a disinfection rinse. And you may think, oh, let me try use this cycle because it's going to be a quick cycle, but actually it has no washing involved. So very important that we understand that we've been properly trained uh, by our service providers uh, that we know what cycle does what on our washer disinfector. Equally, it's important to make sure that we have the correct chemicals, uh, that we there are chemicals, in fact, in the container, that they are working correctly, um, that you have the right uh, type, that you haven't swapped the lances around by accident so that the wrong chemistry is, is, is deployed at the incorrect time. Of course, our machines will alarm from time to time, and if they are alarming, alarming that we manage them, that we know what's causing the alarms and we deal with the issues. And routine maintenance, like anything else, it is a piece of equipment, it needs to perform to a specific standard, and to maintain it, we need to routinely maintain the machines themselves, um, as per the instructions for use of the manual. We've spoken about this before, I'm sure many times you've heard us teach around this concept that it's very important to open the hinge joints, very important to load correctly. And if you don't open the instruments correctly, it'll be absolutely impossible for the water and detergent to make contact with the entire instrument. Uh, 
The same applies to overloading. If you put tons of instruments on top of each other, they will shadow each other and you will not achieve good cleaning. It will be impossible for the water detergent mix to reach or get access to every single instrument because we've shadowed it. As normal, your supplier will give you a user manual. Please make sure that you've read your user manual and that you know what it is you're supposed to be doing to look after the equipment. Uh, this is an example of a Ken's user manual and it talks to the fact that uh, you should be checking if the nozzles and the wash-ons are free from dirt. Um, because obviously if there's a clogged, no a, clogged, a clogged nozzle, it won't be able to clean properly. We need to remove any of the plugs. Uh, please don't do things without uh, consulting your service provider, please. But you need to make sure that the, the, the washer nozzles are empty. Uh, it is possible to remove the washer arms. Again, not something you should be doing yourself. We came on site one day because there was a complaint for a washer that wasn't working effectively. And what had happened is somebody had removed the, the washer arm from the, from the very top level. And that particular washer arm has holes that spray downwards, of course, because there's no reason to spray upwards. The, um, the, the, the washer arms on the subsequent levels have got holes that spray up and down, but the very top one just sprays downwards. And somebody put it in the wrong way around now. Of course, it was spraying the roof and not cleaning the instruments. If you look at the image on the right, that's actually um, um, a, a chemical indicator, an MVR, that had got stuck in a spray arm because um, the staff forgot to clean out all of these things before they put the tray of instruments into the washer disinfector. So please remove the rubber shods, remove the bits of, 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 um, of MVRs, remove all the little bits of bone and tissue and, and needles and all the odd bits and pieces that sometimes are returned in the trays themselves before placing the tray into the washer disinfector. The image on the left is a whole bunch of items that we have taken out of the spray arms before that have managed to sneak through into some, by some miracle, didn't break the machine, didn't damage the pump, uh, but ended up in the spray arms. Of course, when you're loading, you also want to make sure that the arms themselves can rotate, that they can rotate the full 360 degrees. You want to check that the arm itself is not getting stuck, but also more importantly, once you've loaded, that you haven't got like a really tall item, maybe an ovards or something. And if you swing the arm and it keeps getting stuck on the ovards, you're going to damage the arm itself and you'll have very ineffective cleaning. So important to swing and rotate those arms to make sure that they can rotate properly for effective cleaning. In all likelihood, there's going to be some form of filter or sieve at the bottom of the washer, and this is very important that you clean it uh, as many times as required. Now, how dirty it gets will depend on how well you manage the, the uh, instrument trays before you actually put them into the washer disinfector. Of course, doing so, you need to do so carefully that you don't hurt yourself. Um, it can be hot inside the washer disinfector. And to do this, you, you're going to need to, to remove the loading carriage and the loading carriage. So you need the loading trolley to put that onto that you don't injure yourself. They can be heavy. So very important that we do this. Um, and that sieve itself or filter will need to be cleaned as per the manufacturer's instructions for use. Talking about those cleaning racks, of course, if you, you have to now remove this rack to get to the sieve or the filter to clean everything out. When you put the rack back, you need to make sure you do it correctly. So training is absolutely critical. Training on the washer itself, training on the cycles, training on the parameters, understanding how to load uh, the washer disinfector or load the instruments inside the washer disinfector is equally as important, and having the right racks. So if you look at this image on the left with the blue circles, what had happened is there's a, a manifold, that white little manifold over there, and that's actually the water inlet. So in this particular instance, the, the carriage was put into, uh, into the washer chamber the wrong way around, which meant that the water was butting up against that stainless steel part over there and not actually going into the manifold and then into the arms as it was supposed to be doing. So very important that you understand the racks and what type of rack you have and what the rack's purpose is, because there are different racks for different functions. And if we don't load correctly or use the correct accessories at the end of the day, we will not get very effective cleaning. 
if you need to now replace a washer up or, or perhaps buy a washer for the first time, there are a number of things you need to take into account. And of course, the first thing you're going to need to figure out is what um, what devices are you actually going to be cleaning? What shape are the instruments? What types of surgical procedures are you doing? Uh, because that will tell you what kind of devices you have at the end of the day. If you're doing orthopedics, that means a ton, a huge volume of instrumentation potentially for one case. If you're doing a joint replacement, what, eight, nine, ten, ten trays potentially for one case. If it's a DNC or loss of gynecology or ENT, you're only going to use one tray per surgical procedure. Whereas if it's orthopedics, you're going to have huge volumes. You also need to understand the volumes of surgery itself, as in, are you doing 20 cases a day? Or are you doing 100 cases a day? And as I say, what type of cases? All of that will inform you as to what size of chamber you need. Are you going to go with a big chamber to get in as many as possible? Or you're going to go with a slightly smaller chamber. The rack itself, the thing that you need to consider, uh, would be things like, um, yes, a five level rack means that you can possibly get 10 trays into your instrument uh, uh, washer disinfector, for example. But if you use a five level rack, the um, the type of instruments or the, 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 the height between the two trays is quite low. So you might get, if you put an ovoids in there, it could get stuck because it can't fit in or some, um, some forms of retractors will be a problem for a five level rack. So it might be uh, more advisable to have a, a, a rack that you can uh, adjust and maybe take the take one of the shelves out so you can get more room for those particular types of items. So things to think about and then what type of accessories or cleaning racks do you need? Um, because it depends on what types of devices you're going to put through the washer. In this particular um, uh, document uh, that was published called Washer Disinfector and Cart Washer Racks in the Health Purchasing News, they talked to the fact that the goal of mechanical cleaning, of course, is to supply cleaning action to all surfaces of reusable medical instrumentation for enough time to remove the soils. Okay, so the cleaning solution has got to get to the surfaces of the devices for enough time to remove the soils. How quickly the cleaning soils are removed will depend, and that will depend on a multitude of things, including the cleaning formulation, the chemistry itself, the temperature of the solution, and the force at which it's delivered. Remember, I spoke about it, the force of water. Racks contain and hold devices and surgical instruments throughout the cleaning, rinsing, and thermal disinfection and drying steps. That's their job. So at the end of the day, the right rack is going to promote effective cleaning or better cleaning. Shadowing, of course, occurs when something comes between the instrument and the spray arm, and this prevents good cleaning and rinsing at the end of the day. So overloading racks or not using the correct rack can lead to residual soils or cleaning chemistries left on the instruments that may or can harm a patient. Again, important, the rack itself is extremely important and how you load the washer using that rack matters. All very logical and simple things, but at the end of the day, very important. So in the next couple of slides, we'll talk a little bit more about installation and site preparation. And no, we're not cl clinical engineers, but it is or maintenance engineering. Um, but it's quite important that we've got a general idea on all of these factors so that we too can think about the consequences. Of course, we're going to need to identify where the machine will need to be placed. Uh, we need to make sure that it's going to fit in the designated area. So knowing how tall it is, how wide it is, how deep it is matters. We also need to provide space for access to the service areas, of course, and depends on the make and the model of the machine. So this particular one, for example, the access for the servicing is from the front, which is really quite a useful feature um, because you don't have to leave space between the machines themselves. So you could put the machines uh, closer together, kind of narrowing the footprint. Of course, at the point where we're going to install the machine, we're going to need utilities, power, which will be three phase, water, um, hot and cold. Uh, there'll need to be some drains and what the drains are made of, the diameter of the drain itself, and the material that it's made of need to be able to withstand out to one degrees. So standard plastic drains are not going to be great. Uh, you're going to need to exhaust the fumes. 
Remember, that's um, uh, microorganisms and chemistries that are being uh, uh, released through the top of the machine. Um, so you need to be able to exhaust that. If you don't have an exhaust system or you can't install an exhaust system, then maybe you're going to ask for a condenser system, for example, instead. But if you are using a condenser, it may make the machine taller and you're going to need to understand that. The exhaust itself needs to be at a specific um, angle. Otherwise, you get run back into the machine. Very important things to consider is a nice picture of an exhaust system. So important to know the drains, the positioning, the type of the material, the space constraints, the water supply, the incoming power. These are all things where, uh, that we've experienced when doing installations that have been uh, could potentially be problematic. Of course, just to remind you that without complete removal of debris and bioburner, it is impossible, absolutely impossible, to guarantee the sterilization or disinfection, for that matter, of any instruments. Debris that is adheres to an instrument can prevent contact with the sterilant. So even if the sterilizer is working perfectly, the sterility of a device uh, that is not clean cannot be ensured. So what else matters? Well, we need to make sure that the machine itself is doing what it said it was going to do. And we do that by verifying cleaning. Testing washer uh, disinfectors uh, is, is on a regular basis verifies that the, um, the equipment is functioning properly and identifies an opportunity for corrective action. So important to check that everything is working correctly. And if it's not, there is the time now to correct this. Washer indicators like the SDF, for example, will verify the proper performance of an automated washer, but they cannot guarantee that every instrument is clean because, of course, there are certain things that will affect that, like how you loaded it, for example. Uh, failures can be as a result, cleaning failures can be as the result of incorrect chemicals, expired chemicals, incorrect cycle selection, a block spray ion, incorrect loading or water pressure issues. Now, it's ideally to perform this test with every load or at the very least daily, this type of test, a cleaning verification test. So I've been called to a hospital before where we, we had an issue where for some unknown reason the instruments were just not coming clean and the STF was just not being, was not passing correctly. And when we arrived on site, we tried to investigate all of the matters. We looked um, at the bottom. There were two containers that had chemistry in them. There was lances were in the correct container. The, the, the label on the outside, by way of the label, it said that the chemistries weren't expired. We went through all of the mechanical actions of the machine. Everything was working correctly. And when we, um, we looked closer at the detergent itself, somebody had in fact replaced the detergent with water. So as a result, the machine was not working and cleaning effectively in the SDF. Picked that up nicely. Very important to verify cleaning. Other than using an, uh, this type of device, you would always, of course, visually inspect the machines, the, the, um, the instruments themselves. And in the event of a failed test, you want to be able to investigate the root cause. You'll look for things like um, um, cleaning chemistries, look for blocked spray arms, look for the correct dose of detergent that that's being, uh, is being dosed correctly. So you might need your service provider to come in to assist you with that. Uh, that you always also to check that you're using the product, the indicator itself correctly, that the indicator itself had been stored correctly and not expired. Um, and if there is any concerns or confusion, please contact your supplier for assistance. Um, if you look at this particular um, uh, cleaning uh, indicator, it does have the ability to give you some idea of what may be an issue. For example, if only one side of the indicator is coming clean, it may be an impingement rela related thing. Or if the entire thing is has changed color but not correctly, then perhaps it's a chemistry related issue. So let's just think a little bit now of what all we've actually learned and covered today. We've spoken about the fact that an automated washer disinfector minimizes the amount of handing required and that it has a thermal disinfection rinse, making it so much safer for the patient as well as us that need to handle these instruments. We've learned a bit more about ISO SANS 15803, the standard that governs the manufacture of these types of washer disinfectors.
We've learned about how to manage our washer disinfectors. We've learned about doing all the relative checks. We've learned about or reminded ourselves about the importance of reading the manual and understanding the instructions and getting adequate training from our supplier. And we've also learned about the importance of being able to verify cleaning efficacy. If we sum up all three of these webinars, what we reminded of is that cleaning is very important or even a critical step in the decontamination process. For cleaning to be effective, we need detergent, we need friction and we need water. All of these components are important. Of course, cleaning manually is uh, friction is created by brushing and scrubbing. In ultrasonic cleaning, the friction is created by cavitation. And in an automated washer disinfectant, the friction is created by the spray force from the rotating arms. It's vital to follow the manufacturer's instructions for use when cleaning any device or instrument. And that is the manufacturer of the instrument's instructions for use, because they may very well stipulate that this device needs to go into an ultrasonic cleaner for 10 minutes, and then following that, it should go into a washer disinfector. We need to ensure that all staff are well trained, and they know how to safely and correctly use cleaning equipment and cleaning detergents or chemistries very important. Don't forget to have your eyewash station on the dirty side of the CCT as well. The Department of Health or Office of Health Standards Compliance are going to look for that when they audit your facility. Remember, of course, if a device is not properly cleaned, it can never be sterilized or achieve high level disinfection. And very important that we maintain our equipment and verify that it is working effectively. Thank you so much for joining us today and hopefully for all three webinars. Um, as normal, we will send you an email with a link to the test questions. If you complete those test questions, you will receive a certificate of attendance. Hope you've enjoyed these, uh, web this webinar series on effective cleaning and thank you again for joining us today.